think we are live. Aha, wave, 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 wave. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. It is Thursday, October the 22nd, in the 43rd week of this momentous year 2020. How are we? How's your week been? Well, yeah, up and down, yo-yo, yo-yo, people requesting to join by video. There's only one person requesting to, who can join me today. I'm very, I'm really looking forward actually to speaking to Yanis. Um, Yanis of Foles, the mighty Foles. And you don't want to hear me talk to myself anymore, so I'm going to see if he's here. He's not here yet. Yanis. Oh, there he is. Send request. request. Yanis is brilliant, says Sun Ascending. Yanis is brilliant. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ed. <clears throat> hey, brother. How are you? Good. How you doing? I'm all right. Thank you for joining me. That's a pleasure. Is the line all right? I'm kind of notorious for having bad Wi-Fi, so... You, I can hear you loud and clear. I, I've, I didn't bring... I forgot my earphones this week, so this is the first time I haven't got my earphones, so I'm hearing you within the reverberation of the room. <laughs> how, how does that feel? Pretty good? It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so how nice. the devil... How are you? I'm, I can't remember the last time we spoke. Was it at your gig? We must have spoken before that. Uh, yeah, we've chatted a bit, like, via text, but the last time... Yeah. Um, it was at your show. Yeah, which, but which one, though? Because there's... Uh, I remember the Ali Pali... I mean, Ali Pali was the one where we... Um, I actually just texted my mum to say, I'm doing it. I can't talk to you tonight, but I'm chatting to Ed, Ed O'Brien on, um, on Insta. And she was like, oh, the lovely boys chatting. I remember that. We had a good chat. We had Ali great... Pali. Your mum, I, you know, like, I loved meeting your mum. Like, some people, when you meet them, like, you have a connection, you feel their energy. And your yeah. mum, it was so interesting for me, meeting your mum, and knowing you a little bit, and I was just like, ah, okay, I could see a whole... I want to get onto that, but it was, it was, such, a, it was such an amazing... Event. I mean, that gig was extraordinary. I mean, how was it for you? Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. That uh, the fact that there was two in a row was just like yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but the whole, I mean, that whole tour was just felt like it was charged, you know. Yeah. And um, I definitely felt slightly unhinged. Like I don't, I can't really relate fully to the person that was playing that show <laughs> now that I've been cooped up. Uh, I love, flat. I love seeing you when you're like that because. You, you know, it is such a charged performance that you all give, but you as the front man, especially that connection that you have getting in the audience. I love seeing you after a show like that. I've seen you a couple of times and there's this kind of like, there's the, I can see the whites of your eyes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can feel it. it's very, it's very tangible. It's very potent. And, you know, you guys as a live band. So my, my, my thing with, I, may, I, I haven't probably explained so, I, it's this weird thing. I get into you the same time as Sal, my 13 year old son. Yeah. And going to. He's got taste. Sal's got taste. He's got taste. He's got real taste. And he'll he'll be watching as we. This will be the only one. As we make fools of ourselves. And he's always like, is is Yanis going to come over sometime? And I said, yeah, we need to get him over some. Anyway, I recognize why he also is into you because there's it's such a you know i always think your album holy fire was so aptly named because there's such a fire in your band there's such a it's spiritual i mean i don't know what it's like for you on stage but it's a spiritual thing it, it but it's a very powerful thing it's not like you know it's a it reminds me i don't know if i told you but one of the best gigs I ever went to in my life. So I've been going since 1983, before you were born. And I went to a gig in 1985. I saw you two at the time, around the time of Unforgettable Fire. And it was pre, it was about two weeks before Live Aid. And it was pre, they went massive. But it, what you have really reminds me of what they had this kind of, 
this fire and this desire to connect and uplift, but this kind of, it's, it's, it's almost like paganism. There's a, there's, it is a, I really feel there's a spiritual thing going on there. And I really, you know, I can feel it in the gig. I don't know if it's something you feel comfortable talking about, but, you know. Um, no, I do, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that um, it's never something that's necessarily talked about explicitly. Uh, but I think that we're all attracted, whether it's to an idea in the writing room when it's just, the, you know, just the group of us playing, um, there will be a kind of something that we're chasing. And I feel that there's a kind of, there's a, we're, we're the moth and there's a light somewhere and we're trying to find it. And whether it's in the mood of a song or whether it's the way that we play live on stage, we're always chasing for something and we're always hungry. Yeah. And... And really, and, and that's not to do with the size of a show no. or like the potency of a riff or the so, or like, you know, the poppiness of a chorus. It's to do with something else. Yeah. I feel like it's to do with some sort of, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to articulate that, that bit of it, but it's like to do with something deeper than that yeah. stuff, you know? And there's, there's this uplifting side to it there's a beautiful side to it and then there's also like what you're talking about sometimes the power and the kind of not necessarily rage but like there's a type of bristling yeah. kind of animalistic thing that goes on in our band um you know certainly when we play songs like what went down and stuff i don't feel that there's um that it's a benign force <laughs> it feels you know what I mean? It feels no, sort not. of devilish. It not feels on, a bit not, <laughs> not on what went down. It's like, it's just, yeah. ah! It's, yeah. It's just such a powerful song. And the way, I mean, that, you know, even thinking about that song, like, puts a kind of spine tingle down. You know, I get spine tingle because it's the way that it, 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 it builds and that, it, you know, the riff, but that incessant pulse, Jack kind of like propelling and you just like, it's, it's, it's almost like it's got kind of like, I feel like sometimes in your music, there's a kind of like, you know, like, like a bull, like a bull rage, almost like a, there's a kind of, there's a real animal spirit about your music, like a rampant bull or something. It's just gathering, gathering momentum. And it's, yeah. it's like, it's, you know, maybe like the Toreador, we just like move it out of the way and flick it, you know, and or whatever. I don't want to use yeah. the Toreador analogy because that's horrible, but. But no, yeah, I mean, you're right. I think you, there, there's this, yeah, it's like, it's like trying to latch on to the animal, yeah. you know, uh, it, 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 and, and the song is kind of your brief moment of capturing yeah. the animal and then you ride it for three minutes yeah. and then it's done, you know, and then you're back to, you're back to, to being a human again. I think that there's definitely, you know, about the, I've been reflecting a little bit because obviously I've been at home a lot about the different sides to myself and oneself if you're in yeah uh any, any band you know there is this kind of dual self there's the you you are at home with your family or your kids or your parents or whoever it might be your partner um and in your domestic confine and then there's this other at least i you know feel yeah. that there's this other very distinct sense of self that's the person um if not on tour then certainly on stage you know yeah and you tap um, into that don't you and that's the thing that you, and it's almost like you can forget about that person i used to I used to really struggle with what I called uh, uh, band man and, and family man. Yeah. And like, I don't know if you found this, but like the, 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 when you're fully in band man, it's great. And when you're fully in family man, it's great. But the, Yeah, it's the, the transition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that. That sucks. That, that's, that, yeah. <laughs> It's Woe both... the, the start of the tour and the end of the tour when we get home, yeah, right? Exactly. I heard stories about um, about you two that um, in order to avoid that, that they would sort of check into a hotel yeah. at the end of it. So they'd play their last show yeah. and then they wouldn't go straight home. That They would go to a hotel to kind of to, to have that weird transitional phase in privacy yeah. with room service and a robe yeah. and, and no one within the blast radius. You only, only you two could do that. I, yeah. I actually, I talked about it quite, about 12 years ago, so I talked about it quite a lot with my wife about trying to find solutions with coming back like a bull in a china shop. And my answer to it, I don't want to, I've had enough of fucking hotels. All yeah. I kept on saying, can I just go and camp in the woods for five days? Yeah. That for me would be perfect therapy, you know? And that, that I think that, you know, when you've got little kids, 
you know, the end of the tour, you can't go, oh, I'm just going away for five days camping. You know, that doesn't go down too well. So, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. funny. I did this, I had this, I remember I really struggled with it for a while. And I don't know if you have at times, but I struggled, it, especially when the kids were small, because you get back off tour and you haven't got kids yet, but you get back off on tour. And we can have this discussion when, you, when and if you do have kids. But yeah. You get through the door and literally, you know, Susan, my, your wife has been with them 24 seven for five weeks. And she said, here you are. And you're like, fuck, you know. Yeah. And, and I did this thing. I had this amazing acupuncturist called Jared, and he used to be a Gestalt therapist. And I said, I saw him in the first place. I said, Jared, I'm, I'm a fucking nightmare. I'm, you know, I, I can't. And he said, okay. And he said, he did this, he did this Gestalt therapy thing. And he laid out two that, chairs. That means holistic, right, doesn't it? Gestalt? I don't know. It, so it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm not sure yeah. what it means. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's kind of Jungian or something. It sounds Jungian, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, it holistic. Does. It's not just, you know. So he laid out two chairs. And he said, in one chair, you're going to be band man. And in the other one, you're going to be a uh, family man. And you're going to have a conversation with band man. So you're going to say, and, and he said, this might sound weird. So I got in one chair and I said to, to fam, I was band man. I said to family man, I'm struggling with this. <laughs> then I got in the other chair and I did this for about 10 minutes, like swapping chairs. And do you know what? It fucking worked. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and I hadn't been smoking anything. I hadn't been taking it. Yeah, you hadn't been, uh, yeah, you hadn't, you hadn't been going shamanic. <laughs> no. So, um, I, yeah, I know. I feel like, especially, I mean, you know, for, for it's, how are you doing? I mean, because you had a big tour line. I mean, I know you've rescheduled the dates. So how are you coping with this whole time? How are you, you know, how are you doing? I mean, if we're speaking honestly, yes. I think, which we are, right? We are. I mean, that's no, the no, kind of, no British or we're, yeah. it's all fine, honestly. Um, I th so it, it's a two-part answer. So one is like, I definitely am relishing aspects of being at home and I definitely I'm, I'm reminding myself that there was large swathes of tour where I was like I really just want to be at home a bit I want to be you know I want to see my girlfriend I want to see my mum I feel that I've spent a decade in in vans with you know the guys and backstage rooms and stuff and really I just want um I, so the the positive side to this period has been for the first time in, in probably about a decade, like an actual moment where um, I can really stop to take stock of what's going on and think about what it is, you know, that um, I'm doing with my life and, and how I'd like and how I'd like the next decade to go and, and what are the things that have been really meaningful in the last decade and what are the things that are really important in a way where I feel like I've not really had the chance to do that, you know, when it goes from playing shows, you come home, you kind of essentially are healing for a bit. Um, and then it's like, oh, let's start writing music again. Let's next, you know, so you never have a chance for that. On the, and that's only been afforded to me because not only about being at home, but that there's nothing, I mean, there's basically literally barely a music industry out there at the moment. There's yeah. no kind of, there's no one like hassling me, you know. Um, or any of us really but um but then on the other side of it I, I definitely am struggling to find a sense of structure you know mm -hmm. and I think that's quite important and also just realizing that 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 I am, that I have and my purpose is to orbit this idea of oh well I will write these songs and they will come out into the world and people will hear them and then we'll be touring like I've realized how much of my whole life is centered on all of that Mm. Uh, and to have that kind of taken away and to have all that connection with other people has made me realize that my life is kind of far more solitary than I thought. I feel that, you know, I'm quite, the, quite a gregarious, um, extroverted guy, and I realize actually most of that impression is just from being on stage more than, you know. Um, what, are you, what, what are you, sorry, are you saying you aren't, you, you aren't as gregarious as you make out to be? Are you more solitary? I mean that I think that my perception of myself has been clouded by like just touring. And so yeah. I just, I kind of, I think about connections with people and, but actually mo a lot of those are to, through shows. 
Um, and totally. Then, so I, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's, I mean, yeah, you know, the, the, the touring thing is such a weird thing because it, it's such an extraordinary experience, isn't it? To tour and, and, you know, to do what we do and to connect and do this music, but there, I don't know. I mean, there's a healthy side, but it can also become unhealthy, can't it? And like, yeah. and I think what you said, what, you know, to, to step off and to actually, you know, and I think this is the case for everybody. I was reading, I'm, I'm really into, the, I'm really into, he's very much in vogue at the moment, but I've been reading this Wim Hof book and I really, really like what he says. And I've been doing his exercise. He's the, you, do you know him? He's the I don't know. I don't, no, I don't know him. All right, I'm going to send you a copy of his book because I think you'll really like it. And Sweet. I like his name already. Basically that thing about, you know, stepping off the merry-go-round and we're all on it to a certain extent whether we're in bands or not but that thing about and i think what you're doing is going through what a lot of people are doing is it's like well i've been doing this for 10 years oh i've been doing this and here i am and i'm approaching you know you're younger than me i'm in middle age and you go like well what do i want to do for the rest of my life because <laughs> For me, in 20 years' time, I'm going to be 72. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, and I, I tell you what, that's, that's quite, that's, that for me is like, because 20 years ago, I was 32. Yeah, yeah. And like, what happened in 20 years? I mean, it went like that. So I think it is an important time. And I think it's really good. And I think, you know, we don't, we don't know what's going to be ahead of us. But, yeah. Um, I th and I think this is relevant to, I, I think, you know, one when people kind of in some ways misguidedly referred to the COVID thing as being this like leveler, you know, like, yeah. oh, we're, we're all in the same boat. I mean, we're not all in the no, same boat. Not. Some of us are a lot, a lot more fortunate, but yeah. I think that what we're both talking about is relevant to anybody that's had to stop. It's like the first time when you can actually really stop whatever your work is, whatever your vocation is and have this time where, yeah, you might be, you're stressing and you're worried and you're anxious about the future, but it, it's the first time you can really think about your future without yeah. being on the hamster wheel. And I think yeah. that, that's, been, that's been a positive, I think. Um, even if, the, even if the, the things that one might have realised might not be super positive, yeah. like, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, it's crazy, isn't it? I, I, I know we've been texting this week and I had, I've had a fucking roller coaster of a week. Yeah, and you've been and up and is, down, right? Yeah, like that. And I'm sure, I think that's the same with everybody, isn't it? You have, when you have a bad day, I mean, I, I want to tell you about, so I hit a low on Tuesday. So, and I'll tell you this, because it's quite funny. It's like that, it's like that, that saying, humour is trauma plus time. Yeah. So we, we rent a house, we, we, our home is in Wales. Yeah. We rent in London. And we've just discovered that we've got a really bad mould and damp problem. So we have to get our ASAP. In London. In London. So we, I just, you know, all that stuff. So part of the process is we have to move and we have to clear out the house. So I went to Summers Lane Recycling Depot, right. which is a dump and a literally a, a dump. Yeah, an actual dump. <laughs> an actual dump. <laughs> On Tuesday. And I was having a particularly bad day. And this, I, 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 I've been grumpy in the morning and I, I, a few terse words towards Susan, you know, I, I'm not proud yeah. of that. And I left Which with, you regretted quite promptly, right? Yeah. And I left with my tail between my legs in a foul yeah. mood going to the dump and I arrived there. And it's so depressing because first of all, I, it was a horrible day, but you're faced with Everybody, I mean, how much shit do we need in our lives? There's so much, and in these dumps, yeah. there's like all the detritus of modern society, all this crap that we're sort of lulled into buying and then breaks down after three or four years. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, in my head, my thought process is going, fucking hell, we need to sort out waste management. That's the noblest thing. That's what I should be telling my children to do, is to get into waste management. That's what the world needs. So there's yeah. obviously an element of truth. And then there's this radio playing. And it's playing, it's kind what, of... in the dump? Yeah, they've got no. a radio playing. Right, oh, right, yeah. And yeah. it's like something from a dystopian film. And it's, of course, it's like one of those uh, golden uh, heart FMs or something. Something where they just play golden oldies. Yeah, cheese FM. Oh, and, you know, they, one of the songs... And, and it's just like the soundtrack. To, it's like something from... A Huxley novel. It really, it really was. Yeah. And, and I was just like, 
fucking hell is this it? And, and then David Bowie's Ashes to Ashes came on. And, you know, we all love Bowie, but it was like this horrible kind of, it was like, anyway, that was- It my, sounds quite, was, but it sounds quite, it sounds horrible, but it sounds kind of profound. Like it, to be, it, to be physically confronted with all of the things we kind of, you know, turn yeah. our, we turn a blind eye to. Like, I mean, I, I notice even in a much simpler level, just with the recycle, we have a, I have a small recycling bag yeah. Yeah. Um, that then goes into the recycling bin out, outside of my flat in London. And, and, you know, I just, I'm so aware of how quickly that thing fills up. And, yeah. and we, you know, in my, in my house, we do try to do our bit. We, we go yeah. to like a bring your own shop. We do like a bulk buy stuff try to avoid as much plastic as possible. Even with that, it's just like, and I think that's the kind of thing where hopefully, I mean, we're kind of at a forked road, aren't we? Yeah. Um, like on a societal level where there's a chance, you know, and obviously Bor Boris in, in the UK has been um, uh, at least <laughs> play playing to that, hasn't he? Like, oh, we're going to do this green revolution once stuff starts up again. I mean, are we really? Yeah. Um, not with him in power, anyway. Not but, with uh, him. Yeah, not with old De Feffel. Um, Don't get me but, started. Yeah, maybe let's not go there. But, um, <laughs> but, but, the, but there is a genuine kind of, um, you know, either we can go back to the way things were, no. uh, you know, but even probably more excessively um, in order to catch up and to kind of continue the growth model. Or maybe there will be places where there will be a kind of, um, there'll, be a, there'll be a genuine te te like taking of stock and, a, and a, change of, a change of approach, which would be, which is much needed, isn't it? I, I mean, more so. than much needed. I hope so. I really hope so. I want to ask you something. I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time, and I want to know if it's a rumour. I want to talk a bit about Oxford, because we're both from Oxford. Yeah, we are, yeah. We well, are. Yeah, but you're from just outside Oxford, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> Brandon boy. Yeah, Brandon. No, yeah, well, his, my, my, my thing is I was born in Oxford and I spent the first 10 years of Oxford. I lived on the Banbury Road. My parents right, yeah. were osteopaths and we lived in a massive house on the Banbury Road. Yeah, some big, got, yeah. Big, some old, big pads. Big pads. And, um, and then my parents split up and my mum and my sister and I went to live out near Farringdon, this little, this little village. But I, but I used to come into Oxford. All my friends lived in Oxford. So I, I kind of, and then when I got back, I went to university in Manchester and I came back and I lived in Oxford for about three years and I lived east rather than north or south. Yeah. But so. Cowley, Cowley Road Massive. Cowley Road Massive. OX4 yeah. in the area. OX4, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I heard a story, right? I want to know if this is true and I want to pick, I want, I want to ask. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So is it true that you, started at Oxford University? Is that the question? Yes, first of all, is that true? Yeah, yeah, I went to Oxford, yeah, for a what year. What college were you at? I went to St. John's. No fucking way. So what did you yeah. study, English? Yeah, I studied English, yeah. You, so for those of people out there who don't realise, my friend Robbie went to St. John's and studied English and like the creme de la creme. So you are seriously bright. Um, I, I yes. think... At, no, yeah, I mean, th there's no reservation. Like you're academic, you can, yeah, you can false modesty, but you got that's 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 the top thing. Balliol and St John's, St John's reading. So, is it true you dropped out after a year? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> ah! Yeah. Okay. First, I want to ask you how did how were your mum and dad about that? Um, they were they were pretty yeah they were pretty cheesed to put it mildly. I mean, my dad in particular who. Um, to him, you know, he is from a small Greek island, and when he first went to Oxford in the 60s, just, he was with my mum there. Uh, both my parents value education about, yeah. above anything else. They're not interested in money and stuff. They think to be educated is the kind of ultimate goal. Um, uh, and they're not wrong, I don't think, in many ways. But, like, uh, my dad, when he first went to Oxford, said in Greek, which he just thought it was paradise. Yeah. Um, and to this day, like, he loves it. He loves to, to, to go to Black Wells and all that stuff. Um, so he was, yeah, he was pretty horrified. Mo most of my family were, to be honest. Um, but, but it, it, you know, to put it in context, what happened was I was quite rebellious, you know, um, from about, like, teens onward. I was, you know, I was getting in trouble. 
I like what kind to... of trouble? I just I got in trouble. trouble. Just, just trouble at school and stuff. <laughs> um, I like to smoke. You know, I, I, I'd like to smoke. smoke. Were you in trouble with the law, or was it kind of trouble? I didn't. It, it could have got. I, I got yeah. close to getting in trouble with the law, but I didn't really. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was doing stuff that was probably, you know, was illegal and. Yeah. Um, and just, I just had a bit of a chip, you know, I was just a bit chippy and I yes. had a bit of a, I had a bit of an attitude. <laughs> uh, um, so I went to, uh, I had, a, I had like a year out before going to Oxford, went to Oxford, um, didn't, you know, I made a couple of really good friends and really enjoyed some of the, the teaching and stuff. Like I really liked a lot of the poetry, um, you know, I won't bore you with the whole thing, but basically I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel that at home overall. And really mm. my, my true calling was, was like, at least I, you know, thought was, I wanted to create, whether I, I wanted to write or make music. I didn't really want to study other people's, you know, I didn't want yeah. to study like a T.S. Eliot poem and then write what I thought was quite a bad essay on it, you know. Um, so I got the keys to the music room and then just started writing a lot of the early Foles loops there. And then all the guys would kind of, come in like jack would kind of creep in past the porters and i just had the key to it so we just did wrote all the early false stuff there wow and then did some parties <laughs> on the cowley road house parties and then on that summer holiday my dad had lent me money for a van um to buy a van and we had some shows and then we we were, we sent demos out and we got a rec we got offered a record deal wow. that's that holiday. so then i was like yes yeah, of course i'm fucking not going back so <laughs> so then um I just deferred, you know, I was like, let's see how it okay. goes, but yeah, but then never went back, so. Um... I have to say, because listen, I understand, coming from Oxford and, and the premium that is placed on education, and I would think that, you know, although, you know, we, we probably have very, come, you know, although, you know, you've got your, 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 your mother's South African, right, originally? Yeah, yeah. And your father's Greek, so you, but I'm a, I'm a Mongol too, so you probably have very similar ethos in the family in the families and i have to say when i heard that i was just like i fucking love you man <laughs> you know the the the, 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 the cojones the balls to do that and you know because a lot of so you know in radiohead we didn't we didn't have the balls to do that we were like we're going to finish our degrees and yeah. I think, you know you had that kind of you know i totally applaud that because that that was that to you know, if you're at Oxford at St. John's doing English, you could be in the cabinet now. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I should go take Rishi's job. Yeah. <laughs> Yanis for PM, man. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy is yeah, Chancellor. But, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. Chancellor. But it's, I, I, I love that. I really love that. I love the fact that you walked away from something because you, I knew you'd kind of say that that it didn't feel right. But a lot of people be like, okay, I'm going to see this out. I've only got two more years to go. Yeah. I'll wait in this band. But you like, I, I think I was worried that, um, that the, the opportunity to make music would just pass. You oh, know? Okay. Fair enough. That was it. Cause I just thought if we, if we don't take this opportunity, like by the time we come out, you know, who knows whether the band will still be going. And, yeah. and I, and that's just, I guess, I guess it probably highlights like how much of a deep, and desperate need it was for me to um, to make music, and for yeah. and, and it, it wasn't just about to be. If I'm being really candid, it sh it shows that it's. I could have just happily sat there and made music and finished a degree, but there was a desire in me for the music to be heard. Yeah, like I think that, and it's not in the kind of. I think it can be misconstrued in a way where. Yeah, absolutely. There was an ambition and like a hunger and all, all, and all that kind of stuff and the kind of more, but, but, but it, it was something more like deeply psychological about it. Like yeah. I just needed to connect to a, a lot of people. There's obviously something where I need, I feel, I feel like I have to do that. Otherwise I don't feel totally yeah, whole, no, you know? And I love that. I mean, someone, someone's just quizzed up here. They seem great. They said, they just said on the thing, they said praising the dropout and it's, well, it's not, it's not praising the dropout for the sake of dropping out. It's, it's praising someone for following the, having the courage of their convictions, for knowing innately, as you obviously did, you felt it in your soul, in your intuition was screaming out. It's just like, I have to do this. Yeah. And, and I think with music and stuff like that, I think it, you know, I don't think we ever had that kind of calling then and there. We were always kind of like, okay, well, we're going to finish university. 
But yeah, like, maybe you guys some... were the smart, but you know, we never know how things are going to go. Like, I might be, I might be in a few years' time just, but like, I don't know, like busking and being like, God damn it, I should have finished that degree. <laughs> so, <laughs> um... but you know, also there was definitely this thing. I remember the the last thing I'd say about that was I remember this. Um, for me it was a foregone conclusion once that had happened because I was like, I've wasted all my teenage years kind of, you know, spending time dragging amps around in the rain and hanging out with dudes in a musty room where there's like carpet beetles and there's, yeah. you know, and like crack jack cables and then going down to truck, you know, store or whatever to, to buy, you know, buy a CD. And um, I already felt that I'd sacrificed all the time you yeah. know, to get there. So I was like, if I don't take this now, then I've, you know, what was all that about? Yeah. What were, what were all the hours I put into it yeah. about? Did you so, love, did you love the whole romance of it? Cause I think that like, when I look at about the early years, like we used to, as a band, um, we used to, so we, we formed in 1985. So I'm in, I'm in the, I'm becoming the summer term of the lower six. I'm in the sixth form. Tom and Colin are just doing their O levels. Phil's, right doing his or well, phil hadn't joined the band yet and um and uh but we all, it, there was a sense of like i always felt like when i met when, when i met tom and we started doing i was and, and i i've always said this i had this i had this kind of eureka moment you know i was like walking along and and i met tom and we knew one another when we were going to music school and i felt this very very strong force of this is it. This suddenly has become the most important thing in my life, this band. Yeah. But, and like I said, you ha yeah, and we used to, we used to rehearse in, um, so we would go to village halls. There were no rehearsal studios in the 80s. There was, there was when you would have started. You know, yeah. there, was, there was nothing. So Clifton Hampton Village Hall, Sutton, Sutton Courtney. Hall. Sutton Courtney. I knew you were going to have gone to Sutton Courtney. <laughs> we, yeah. we did a runner from Sutton Courtney Village Hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the bill unpaid. It was unpaid for years. I felt guilty about that. And then I, I when we got, when we signed, because our management were, were based in Sutton Courtney, I, I, I wrote a check for a hundred quid to them and, and said, I'm really go. sorry. There you go. With there interest, go. mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's great. But we had that sense of, we did lots of talking and it was like, it was like creating the dream. But it was like all those years of doing that stuff. I always think, and I'm, I, tell, I tell younger musicians, I don't know if you have the same thing. It was like starring in your own movie, your own yeah. movie. Do you, do you have a sense of that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there was, and, you know, I might start to sound sort of like a grumpy old man. I'm, I, all of this is said with the, with, the, with the question of whether it's still like this. I don't know whether it is, but I remember thinking, there was a band from High Wycombe that I kind of fell in love with called Youth Movies. And like, these guys were just the coolest yeah. You know, they were like a gang and they used to play at the Wheat Sheaf in Oxford. I'd go, I'd go out on a school night. I'd go straight with my school uniform or whatever to watch them. And then you'd pick up a pop, like a copy of Enemy or Kerrang! And, and then you'd go to the record store, you know, and there was this kind of huge canon and like a, there was almost like a, a library of cool, you know, it, throughout both historically in the UK and like um and and at the, at the time that being in a band was like this culturally important thing yeah. and that there was a kind of there was a danger to it but there was like also like a nobility to it there was something of meaning there you were kind of like i know there's almost like uh, like being a musical highwayman or something like a brigand yeah. you know out on the, or like a troubadour yeah, and the that, that your songs could change somebody's life and they could mean something culturally and you could be on a you could be on like a news night review, but you could also be in like a gutter, guttery toilet venue and you could be ripping it up and all of that could coincide and be meaningful. Um, and you could speak the language of, of, of the current time that a, a rock song or a, you know, a song with a guitar would be, um, it would be the language of the time, you know? And I think that one thing that, and that, I think all of that was true. There's obviously a romance of that, but it was true. Yeah. Um, and there's elements of it that are still there now, but I don't feel that that by being in a band is culturally like no, it's not. There's not the same zeitgeist ever. There's this thing where it's a bit more like retro or considered or just or just niche, like sideline. But at the time yeah. when 
uh, you, you guys are certainly doing it. And, and even when we were starting out, it was definitely like, this is the way to express yourself and for it to be contemporary, but also meaningful. And, yeah. and I don't know whether that's true in quite the same way. Well, Not to just, be a... Yeah, there just aren't as many bands, so a lot more solo artists. I mean, I think it's interesting because I, one of the things that I really love about the contemporary music scene is like that everything's in and things in, you know, there's no yeah. kind of tribalism. That yeah, that's, had, a, that's a great thing. Which is a great thing. And I also, what I also like, I have to say nowadays, is a real, there's a real authenticity to the age. And there's an acceptance. And, you know, I had a real eureka moment. Whether you like Ed Sheeran's music or not, or whether you, the, the same thing with Adele, like watching Adele, like, headline Glastonbury, and she's being herself. And I'm like, fuck, this is so good. Because she could never, and the same thing with Ed Sheeran, they could never have got away with it 20 years ago. Because when we started, you were buying into this sort of, it was almost like- The mistake. Was, yeah. And you're constructing your world and you're constructing your personas. And you, do you know what I mean? You were like, and because like you said, it was such a sort of like, you were, you were, there's this lineage of being in a band, the gang of young yeah. men, the gang. Yeah, I, well, that's the other thing. It was more, much more male dominated. Yeah, in a way. totally. And I, I, I actually think that it was, it's funny because when I think of bands now, I think of them, you know, it is, a, it is a little bit old fashioned in a way. There's something, um, and I think that's what's interesting about like you guys, everything, everything, I'd say Alt-J as well. I think you manage to, you, you, you're not retro, you're not, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a dynamic, but you're doing it in an age where it's not necessarily conducive to being in a band. You know what I mean? Like exactly all those things that you're saying. Yeah. Um, what am I trying to say here? I'm set, it's like swings and roundabouts. I think there are good things about nowadays. Yeah. And, and, and I think the fact that there are way more women in the music industry is so much better. And, and also, I also, I know what I'm really trying to say. I'm really, I never felt comfortable with that thing of sort of, you know, putting up a front. Yeah. I never liked that thing. I like, you know, I, for me, it was all about honest connection. It's about honest communication. Well, even just something like what we're doing tonight, in a way, it, not only was it not possible back then, and one of the great things about now is that we can just have a chat and yeah. it can be, you know, um, we can be ourselves and it's not like, it's not dismantling the, the myth, yeah. you know, of Radiohead or, or, you know. You know I'll yeah. tell, tell you something, you know, for years, like, I mean, this is one of the things that I've really loved. And one of the things I struggled in Radiohead for years was, you know, what happened with Radiohead was, at the beginning, Pablo Honey, first album, yeah. we had not got our shit together. And it was like, it was like these, we looked like five, <laughs> five wallies. You guys, you guys had a look back then. It was, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was so dodgy. And put us on tour in America in 1993, like throwing yeah. these of dudes into America with the whole grunge thing going Hell on. jam. Uh, yeah, and I was coming back with tie-dyed headwear, and it was, it was, you know, it was, we didn't have... I think we need have... to bring that back. I think <laughs> we need to bring that back. <laughs> it was not a collective look. So what happened was, on the second record, it's like, right, put up a front. And it was like, you know, who were the bands that were cool? It was a massive attack, and it was Portis. Yeah. Okay, that's what we're constructing. And so through videos, and through, through the right press, and saying the right things, and the right photos, you construct this world. And then you get to Kid A and you, you draw down the shutters. And, you know, and I totally understand that. But there was a part of me that was just like, I feel like I'm fucking shackled. I can't be myself. I can't say what I want to say. And I think that's why the gigs were always so important. And I, you know, we all did, but I cherished them so much was because um, it was the communication. There was an honesty. But yeah, I, I'm really thankful. I've loved this whole kind of the, like, the last two or three years when it's just like, fuck it. You know, it's like we're living in an age of authenticity and, and, and the age demands authenticity in all ways. You know, that's why, that's why politicians, we look at our politicians and a lot of our business leaders and we're going, you're fucking, in, you're unauthentic, you're inauthentic. Yeah. You, 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 I can, we can smell it, right? Yeah. 
we're in an age when it's so obvious. You go, you look at somebody's body language, you look at, you know, you look at Dominic Cummings and you go, I, you know, you look, you go back to like Tony Blair in 2003, you know, saying, oh, we're still, you know, the whole thing of the war in Iraq, we smelt it, you know, you, and it's interesting. I think what's so fascinating about this time, say a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, the populations were far more malleable. You know, send them off to war in 1914. Your country needs you. You know, it was, but nowadays people are a lot smarter. I really think that, and we can smell it. And I think that's why bands have changed. And I think that's why the artists that were coming through. And it, so I've said this, but one of the things that I really love about you, and it goes back to, I think one of the things about the authenticity of your band, but also of you is, that I see in you, and obviously I, you, you say what you think of, like, I, it's really interesting meeting your mum. So you've got this, you know, this Jewish South African mother, very, she strikes me as being very wise, very kind, very strong, and, and, and you know. And then I haven't met your father, but I've gone to Greece a lot, and I love Greece, and I love, you know, the, the so I can see it almost like on, there's this, there's the, the authenticness that I get from you is this kind of, I can, this very, this very, these poles, right? I've got this, this very sort of Greek, the warrior. I really fucking get that. And like when you're on stage and you fucking, you know, it's like you bare your chest. I'm like waiting for you to take your shirt off and like play that guitar. And, but you've also got this feminine side and I love that. I really love that. And I think you get that from, and I think that's really, really important. Um, <laughs> I don't know how what you say to that, but I just I wanted to I, I've always wanted to tell you that because I think it's a really it, a, what what you do is you you represent an important thing at the moment where there's this very male side to you that we that some men you know men, and you, you allow that to be a but you also balance that with this this feminine side. So um, I'm just going to say well done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that resonates, but. You know, I really see it like we, having met your mum. I just like, okay, I I see you on that side, and I don't know you that well, but I I've definitely got a vibe on you. We've definitely, whenever we meet, I really I feel like we really connect. And I always think like, fuck, I wish I was drinking and being a naughty boy because I'd have so much fun with you. <laughs> anyway, but do you know what I mean? I think you do have that. You have that. I don't know if those if that's maybe I'm talking a load of bollocks, but. Um, that definitely comes out to me. Thanks, man. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, just because I took my headphones out, so sometimes it doesn't work. Um, Would yeah, that be no, true? Thank you. I mean, I... hello. Oh no. Can you hear me? Huh? Oh yeah, you there? We've got a little freezing going on here. You, your notorious Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh, there you are. Yeah, I'm back now, I think, though. Your Wi-Fi is yeah. to be blowing smoke up your ass. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was just a convenient ruse not to have to, to, have to yeah, deal sorry. with the Yeah, sorry. I know it's really hard to follow on like that. I just kind of wanted to, you know, I don't know what... I wanted to no, say... No, I, I appreciate that. I think I, um, I appreciate that. Um, I definitely... I think my mum, you know, my mum brought me and my brother up on her own in Oxford and um, as, a, as an outsider. And I think that, um, I don't really know, but whatever it is, it's kind of like my mum, you know, my mum, yeah. my mum is a character and she, I just, I, I look at, like, I, you know, I try to just keep up with like the washing up and, and like, and the basic facets of being a human like showering and you know brushing one's teeth and like cleaning and then doing stuff and then I look back now to my mum and I'm like she was holding down a job and then coming home and cooking for me and my brother and in a country where she had no family she had nobody that could help out amazing um and you know she's very elderly now and I just like yeah just um yeah she just did you know she did a lot um so uh yeah, and Greece. I mean, we can talk about Greece. Is a, we should put a whole another chat in for Greece in let's twenty whole, years. When let's, let's do, a oh, yeah, pro, do a holiday program on Greece. What? Yeah, we. Can, why not? We should do it. We let's do it because I fucking love Greece. 
I have, I feel, yes. I feel it in the sea, the rocks, the mountains. And when you're sending all your Instagram stuff, I'm going like, oh fuck, I just want to be walking this land with Yanis and, and drinking yeah. again. <laughs> you know, we can, we can, we can drink co Greek coffee is good. It puts, yeah. that puts hair on your chest. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. But, um, and how's your mum doing? Is she okay? Yeah, she's fine. She's just been sheltering. I think she's, she's very sociable, and so she's been struggling a bit with that. Okay. Um, but yeah, she's, she's fine generally. And I, um, yeah, I'm going to go see her actually on Tuesday. So if um, anyone's in Oxford and wants yeah. to say, yeah, so, Where but does yeah. Live? Does, does she live up in Hamilton Road, did you say? No, she, no, she doesn't. Don't tell everybody where she is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she doesn't, though. She, we used to live in Summertown. Oh, okay. Um, what road did you still live in? We used to live on Stratfield Road, which is behind the shops. It, it wasn't quite as posh as it's become, but uh, no. it's become very, very teddies. Oxford, um, for anyone man. that knows that, yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's Oxford, just... When I was when we were there in the seventies, that it was it was North Oxford was bohemian. Most of those houses were owned by Oxford Dons and stuff. Yeah, and it all changed in the eighties. Also, the city, anyway, I mean, we could just go on a yeah, little okay. whinge about Oxford, but there's just Hogwarts shops everywhere. You know, it's like, I mean, Harry Potter is all very well and good, but the whole city centre is now dominated by Hogwarts. Really? Yeah. Oxford's become <laughs> a theme for Harry yeah. Potter. Yeah, it has a little bit. Um, but yeah, right, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to be hoping to write some tunes and stuff. But yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to see you soon. I'd love to see you. And will you send my love to, to, to everybody, oh. Jack? I will, yeah. I'm going to see, I'm gonna see them all tomorrow. I, I love the Foles, magic band. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. It's been all a pleasure right, to chat, man. You take love, care of yourself. Yeah, I love you, Yanis. All right, love you too. Yes, take care. Thanks nice for doing this. Cheers. Pleasure, man. See ya. See ya. That was a pleasure. Oh, Yanis, I love that guy. Okay, everybody. Um, I hope you have a lovely week. Big love, yeah, I, I, yeah, big love to you all. I hope it's a good one. And vote, my American brothers and sisters, please vote, do your thing. Big love, bye-bye.